Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to He Walks With Us Everywhere. I'm Tracy, and today is the 14th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. We'll continue our daily word of encouragement with Charles Spurgeon's Morning by Morning. And this morning's reading is coming out of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. And the word of the Lord says this, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Amen. And Brother Spurgeon says this, Spiritual knowledge of Christ will be a personal knowledge. I cannot know Jesus through another person's acquaintance with him. No, I must know him myself. I must know him on my own account. It will be an intelligent knowledge. I must know him, not as the visionary dreams of him, but as the word reveals him. I must know his natures, divine and human. I must know his offices, his attributes, his works, his shame, his glory. I must meditate upon him until I comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. It will be an affectionate knowledge of him. Indeed, if I know him at all, I must love him. An ounce of heart knowledge is worth a ton of head learning. Our knowledge of him will be a satisfying knowledge. When I know my Savior, my mind will be full to the brim. I shall feel that I have that which my spirit panted after. This is that breath whereof if a man eat, he shall never hunger. At the same time, it will be an exciting knowledge. The more I know of my beloved, the more I shall want to know. The higher I climb, the loftier will be the summits which invite my eager footsteps. I shall want the more as I get the more. Like the miser's treasure, my gold will make me covet more. To conclude, this knowledge of Christ Jesus will be a most happy one. In fact, so elevating that sometimes it will completely bear me up above all trials and doubts and sorrows, and it will, while I enjoy it, make me something more than man is born of woman who is of few days and full of trouble, for it will fling about me the immortality of the ever-living Savior and gird me with the golden girdle of his eternal joy. Come, my soul, sit at Jesus' feet and learn of him all this day. Amen. What a perfect word for the Sabbath. What a perfect word. Come, my soul, sit at his feet and learn of him all this day. Amen. He talks about we need to really know him, right? Not just the thought of him, not just the idea of what other people or other men or women say of him, but we need to know him based off of what the word reveals about him, based off of personal experience, this interaction together with him, right? This relationship that we have with him. And we must meditate upon him until we comprehend with all saints what's the breadth and length and depth and height and know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. You see, head knowledge isn't enough. To know him in thought isn't to know him. To know him from what other people have told us about him isn't enough. We have to experience Christ Jesus for ourselves, don't we? Had a gentleman just yesterday tell me that he had never experienced the blessings of God. He'd never seen the hand of God working in his life or blessing his life. And I looked at him, praise God, without hesitation. And I said, do you obey him? Do you keep his commandments? I said, because blessing follows obedience. And he just looked at me like a deer in headlights. And I said, try keeping his commandments, all 10 of them. There's only 10. Keep his commandments. Put your trust in him and then see what happens. You know, we have a tendency to get all angry and bent out of shape because things aren't going well or because we don't think that things are adding up or that, you know, 
there's difficulties and trials and struggles, but ask the question, am I walking in disobedience in any way to the Lord? Because more often than not, 99% of the time, our misery is a direct result of our disobedience. It is. And that's a fact. And then, you know, this guy went on to say something else about how do we know that, you know, anything written down is the truth and anything in history and all. There's so many different translations and and he's absolutely right. There are so many different translations. But I said, well, my friend, that's where faith comes in. And that's not something that can be taught. You either have it or you don't. And as for me and my house, we choose to believe. I believe the infallible word of God. I believe his word is true. I believe that it's preserved and saved throughout the generations for a time such as this. I believe that the KJV is the inherent infallible word of God. I believe that he's preserved it for his people, just like he said he would. But you see, having that understanding takes faith. That is not something that can be taught. It's not something that can be shared. No more can the relationship we have with Jesus Christ be shared or gotten through the means of following somebody else's idea or example or life than what faith can be had through another. It is extremely personal. It is individual, right? And while God doesn't change and there is nothing different about him, and his word is from everlasting to everlasting and then forevermore, right? What does change is the hearer and the seer and the measure of the faith in which we've been granted. So if you have a little bit of faith today, you hold on tight to it. Hold fast. And tomorrow's Bible study, Lord willing, will touch on this at least just a little bit. It is. It would have been really easy for somebody not solid in their faith, not rock solid in Christ, to hear what this man was spewing and to be carried away by every wind of doctrine, by every deceiving lie of the devil, by every trick, by every deception and delusion and confusion. How important is it that we are firmly rooted in the very word of God? Without it, without faith, Without belief in Jesus Christ, no man can see God. And, and another thing this person said is, well, I just have, I refuse to believe that all of this evil and wickedness, that there would be a God of the Bible. And he said, you know, the God of the Bible, he said, the thing that I always had a problem with is that, you know, I could do good my whole life and be a good person and, and treat other people kind and do right my whole life. But because I don't believe a certain way, because I don't believe the Bible, believe in one thing, I'm going to go to hell. But then somebody else can be a rapist and a murderer and an evil person. They can repent at the end of their life and be saved. And I said, yeah. I said, that's it. And I said, Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth and the life. And he, oh, I, he just completely rejected it. And what do we do with people like that? We continue to profess the true word of God. I would not sit there and allow this guy to continue on in a way that, you know, well, I wasn't going to sit there and just stay silent when there were obvious deceptions that he had drunk down like water. You know, I'm not going to sit there and just nod my head and smile and approve of things that are ungodly. I'm not going to tell him that there's another way. I'm not going to tell him that, oh, well, yeah, if you're a good person. Now, what I did share with him is that, but remember this, God alone judges the intent of the heart. God alone. So it could be that thief on the cross. In those final moments, he asked the Lord to remember him in his kingdom. In those final moments. And he's like, well, yeah, I mean, if the Bible said it like that, that, you know, that, you know, if we did good and in our final moments. And he's like, but that guy saw him. He saw him. We haven't seen him. And I said, we do see him every day, just in different ways. I said, and on that final day, everyone will see him. But that's where faith comes in. That's where faith comes in. 
And I said, and if everybody was told that, if that was what was written in scripture, people would be living like hell and at the last moments repenting. He's like, well, people do do that. And I'm like, and God judges the intent of the heart. God judges the intent of the heart. He knows. And, you know, let me tell you what. He knows, too, that a wicked and evil man or woman who's lived like hell their whole life and hurt numerous, countless people and murdered and offended and raped and plundered and and been all sorts of wicked on this earth. The Lord is going to see their heart. He'll know and only he will know if they genuinely repent, if there is a genuine change in their heart from doing all of that that's detestable to him. But he's not going to accept lip service, is he? Our God won't accept that. It cannot be a half-hearted, half-audited, you know, wink and a nod or whatever you want to say. You know, it can't be that. The Lord sees and judges the intent of the heart. And praise God he does and, and fear God he does, right? We have humble, fearful reverence of the Lord Most High. May he judge our hearts. May he judge the intent of our hearts. And may we be found worthy on that day to be accounted worthy. You see, we're so busy looking at what everybody else is doing and thinking of ourselves as being such great people and doing all these good, you know, exhibits for the, for the Lord or for, for good in general. Well, we're completely missing the arrogancy and pride in our life. If that's all we're looking at, if we really think that there's anything good in us because we help somebody cross the road or we help cover a bill or we feed somebody or put a jacket on somebody's arms, if we think that, that anything good is coming from us, then let me tell you, that good is coming from evil. That good is coming from a place of pride and arrogancy. It's not coming from a genuine place of love. It's not coming from a genuine place of giving or selflessness. It's coming from a place of accolades and look at me's and at a girl. God will judge that in the final moments. That's why the good, seemingly, will be cast into the pit of hell, won't they? It's not because they didn't do good things. It's because their intention was evil. It's not because they didn't do a good work. It's because the reason for doing it had nothing to do with glorifying God, but everything to do with glorifying self. There is no place in heaven for selfish people. There's no place in heaven for arrogant or pride-filled people. You see, pride cometh before the fall. That was the whole purpose of the rebellion of those angels. That was the whole purpose of the fall of man in the garden. It was a pride. It was a desire to know what God knew, to have the knowledge of good and evil. And like I said yesterday, in the garden, they had the ability to make choices. In heaven, the angels had abilities to make choices. Right now in our lives, we have the ability to make choices. And when he returns, when there is a new heaven and a new earth, we will once again and always remain able to make decisions on whether or not to walk in obedience or disobedience, whether or not to follow the Lord Most High or to rebel and allow pride and arrogance and ego and self to get in the way, right? You see... There will not be sin in heaven. But at that point, y'all, my prayer, my hope is that we would have all made those choices here on earth that we're done with all the fleshy lusts. We're done with the pride of life. We're done with the chasing after of the wind. That all of that frivolousness and fruitlessness that we chased after here will be so clearly seen for the dung it really is. And then we'll be forevermore with the Lord and glorify him and honor him and praise him. Hallelujah. And to anyone who says that, you know, they haven't seen God or heard him. Oh, yeah, you have. You're just not looking. Now you have. I can think of numerous, countless times that his hand was at work in my life. And it still is. It's just a difference between acknowledging it or not. And most people 
who can't see him are so wrapped up in themselves. They're so self-revolving, self-satisfying, self-pleasing. There would never be any way for them to see the Lord working in their life because it's all about them. Woe unto them. So we pray for them. We speak truth and we pray. And then we keep speaking truth. And we live our life and we don't back down and we don't cower away because we face opposition. Nope. We rise up. We stand up for what's right and what's true. Not in our own eyes, but in the eyes of our Lord, our Father, our Messiah. And there is only one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. Don't say you're a Christian. Don't say that you were raised in a Christian upbringing and that you believe in a higher power. Baloney. You believe in yourself. You believe in you. You believe in what you can do, what you can accomplish, what you can gain. You do not believe in the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one more thing while I'm at it, while I'm on a rant. To everybody who unsubscribed, I'm sure, because I am against genetic Israel, how incredibly ridiculous it, ridiculous is it to think that these that anybody, not just the Jews, but anybody who claims to be God's people, yet walk in disobedience to him, who claim to be God's people, and yet when all the prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, when all the prophets were speaking forth prophetic words of the Messiah to come, the people around Jesus completely missed it and rejected him and spit on him and then crucified him to a cross. Don't tell me that just because you are genetically Jew, that you're going to somehow inherit the kingdom of God. What a farce. Lies. Liars and deception. That is so far from the truth. So far from it. And anyone out there today who thinks that because their mom or dad, what Spurgeon's talking about, because your mom or dad raised you in a Christian upbringing, because you went to a Bible school, because you went to a Bible college, because you have this or that doctorate or whatever it is behind your name that somehow because you've read the bible from cover to cover you think that you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven woe unto you deceived you're deceived the only way to get into heaven is to have a real genuine relationship with jesus christ our lord our messiah god in the flesh god of the bible the god who our father foretold of numerous times and then he fulfilled all of those prophecies in his years here on earth i for one believe and i have no doubt and there is nothing that anyone can say that'll change my mind and and here's the other thing you know people are like oh well if there's really a god why does he let you know i've seen too much evil and after you've seen what i've seen in this world well you're it'd be hard for you to believe too well let me tell you something we have what's called free will. Each one of us has a choice. We decide whether to walk in the paths of righteousness or wickedness. God doesn't force anybody's hand. It is a personal decision. Pharaoh made a decision to walk in disobedience. He was given warnings. He was giving a, given a chance. He was confronted directly with a prophet of the Most High God, speaking directly from the Lord to him. And he hardened his heart and he continued to, didn't he? So whose fault is it? God's or man's? You see, we cannot blame the most high, omnipotent, perfect, just God for things that wickedness and evil corrupts within us. That comes from the devil, y'all, not from God. So maybe people need to get a little more angry at the devil and a little more angry at the fallen ones, and a little more angry at evil spirits, and find that love of the Father. Because without it, you aren't going to see God. All right, y'all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Abba, you are holy and perfect and just. You're mighty and true and faithful. You are loving and all-knowing and all-seeing. You go before us each and every day, Lord. 
You uphold us. You give us every good thing that we have in our lives. You are every good thing within our lives. Without you, Lord, I'm nothing. Without you, Father, I have nothing. I can do nothing. My strength is from you. My hope is in you. My help is from you. God, help us this day to see our ever-increasing need for you. Help us to die to self, die to flesh. Help us to cry out to you, Lord, in those moments when the world is just hammering upon us, when evil is all around us, when there are deceptions and delusions and distractions galore. Help us to cry out to you all the more, Lord. Let us never know a day without you. God, help us. Help our unbelief. If there is anyone listening to this right now, Lord, who has got any unbelief in them, I just ask that you would break that off of them. In Jesus' name, increase our faith, God. Help us to be strong and zealous for you, to stand firm in our convictions and in the truth. The truth is what sets us free. We thank you, Lord, for setting us free this day. Thank you for taking the shackles off of our feet. Thank you for taking the blinders off of our eyes, for taking the cloud off of our minds. God, thank you for waking us up. Thank you for giving us the ability to worship you, to praise you, to practice keeping your commandments, keeping your Sabbath, keeping holy feast days before we are with you for eternity. Help us to learn each and every day how to please you and serve you better and better. Not to serve self, God. We've done that long enough, but how to serve you in ways that are honoring unto you. Lord, forgive us this day. Forgive me for every thought, word, and deed that is against you, that's considered an abomination or evil in your sight, that is not glorifying to you, that's not obedient to you. Forgive me, Lord, for every time I have turned my back in rebellion and in disobedience and help me to be a humble, obedient servant even unto the death. Lord, we ask for you to let our flight be not in winter, nor on the Sabbath day. We pray for all of those right now who are struggling against tyrannical forces, that are struggling against medical systems, that are struggling against all of these false ideologies and these false doctrines that are spewed out by false prophets. Lord, help us to stand firm this day. Help us to be shielded and protected from all of those attacks of the devil and increase that faith, Lord, so that we can fight this good fight of faith, even until your return or until you call us home, whichever is sooner. And Lord, remove any fear that we have. Let us never be ashamed, Lord, of speaking forth your word. And may your word go forth out of our mouths all the days of our lives. Help us to shine forth as lights in a world of darkness, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and we ask that you would come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. All right, y'all. Announcements, announcements. Tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern, over on FOJC Radio Rumble Channel. They'll be doing a Sunday Night Live over there, uh, David and Brian will, so Hope you'll check it out again. That's 8 p.m. Sunday night on FOJC Radio Rumble. I will be, Lord willing, giving a Bible study in Evansville tomorrow, and I hope to post that either Monday or Tuesday, so keep me in prayer and keep an eye out for that. Okay. Well, I think that is all in way of announcements. Um, we do have an FOJC Radio prayer coming up. That will be at the end of the month, so October 30th. I believe it's a Monday, so mark your calendars, 6 p.m. Central, October Prayerathon. We're going to just go and hopefully do a little damage to the kingdom of darkness. Woohoo! All right. I love all of you. I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath. Get tons of rest. Read, study the word, stay found in him, sit at his feet. Sit at our Lord's feet and learn of him. His ways are meekness and peace and joy and love and hope and all good things all right 
I love all of you. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys for your support and your love and your prayers. And Lord willing, I'll see you here tomorrow.